So we have the first, it's simple in a way, but when we break it down, it gets complicated. The magnetic compass, um, <clears throat> basic diagram of what it looks like in the airplane, um, you know, kind of on a float and swivel and pivots around and you have your compass card, uh, your Earth's magnetic field, um, your magnetic compass obviously pan Ugh, points to magnetic north. <clears throat> okay, your uh, variation is. Um, have, have you guys gotten into variation at all, or, or gave no. you know it from flying? Um, not really, no. Okay, um, <clears throat> variation. There's, there's. Uh, you guys familiar with there's magnetic north and then true north? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. magnetic and ma magnetic north is actually moving <laughs> year to year, which is weird, um, but it's the way it works. So your your that's why your sectionals and your charts come out, um, obviously updating navigational equipment and things like that, and then also your your lines of variation change on it as well. Um, and what it is, just the difference between true north and magnetic north. And we navigate, true, you know, true north is fixed. Lines of latitude, longitude. When you get into cross-country flight planning and discussing that, and that, that uh, I believe you go into that tomorrow. Yeah, that's your last session tomorrow. Um, you plan off of your Latin long uh, uh, lines. You know, those are fixed. Um, but you navigate by your compass, by magnetic heading. So the variation lines are the differences and then corrected to the, the true north. Um, and a gonic line is, if you're navigating around that area, there's no angular difference. And isogonic, those are your, your basically your lines of variation. Um, and this gives you a picture of it. Um, and this, I, I believe this, no, this is fairly accurate, but these lines actually change um, year to year. Um, so you could, you know, be operating. So here's here's an example here. Here's the angular difference. So if you were to, if you wanted to fly north, navigate to, you know, your flight plan and an airport is 360 degrees north when you plan, your compass is going to point three degrees to the right. Okay, and anything on it's a little backwards, but east of this agonic line, mm -hmm. okay, is considered, e east of it is considered lines of um, easterly, or I'm sorry, west, I'm sorry, I'm confusing myself, westerly lines here is considered easterly variation because the magnetic pole is east of the true north pole. So this 13 degrees here, you your compass would be pointing to the magnetic north, but to get to the geographic north, you'd have to subtract your your from your heading, from your magnetic heading. Um, you'd subtract 13 degrees, and that would point you to the North Pole or the geographic North Pole. Okay, um, if you are on the east side of the agonic line, this five degrees, 15 degrees, that's considered a what? And this picture doesn't show it, but that would be a westerly variation um, because the pole would be on the west side, so then you would add. So west is best, east is least is, is kind of the easy way to remember it. West, you add, east, least, you know, you subtract. It's a okay. nice little, you know, I've used it in my whole aviation career when I'm flight planning. I go, wait, east, okay. <laughs> Can you say this again, please? Uh, you could say uh, east is least, west is best. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yep. That also, you can use that for your elevation, too. Yep. That's yep. actually how I was taught that, east is least, west is best. Yep, yep. Okay. And then your um, oscillation error, this is just aircraft vibrations. You know, you're getting some erratic movement of the compass during due due to tur uh, turbulence. Um, this is why we have a heading indicator, because our compass bounces around all over the place. Um, okay, so here's some of the errors. Um, 
my least favorite part, but we all have to do it, we all have to know, but my least favorite part of training for a private pilot was learning uh, compass turns. You know, uh, you simulate you lost your heading indicator, which turns nice and smooth when you turn, and then your compass is just all over the place. But if you're on an east or a west heading, um, you will have acceleration error. So if you accelerate, <clears throat> and it's um, ANDS is the term, ANDS, and I'll pop it up here for you. But if you accelerate, if you're on an east or west heading, you accelerate, the compass will turn to the north. If you decelerate, it'll turn to the south. Okay, here's your little remembering tool. Um, we ands, or just ands, accelerate north, decelerate south. Are you guys gonna, if, or you should, uh, well, you should have the slide. If you guys need to write something down, if I jump ahead, just let me know, I'll go back. Yeah, I see that slide. You need to see it again? No, I, I, I have it here. Okay, okay. Oh yeah, if you've it printed out, then you're good. Do you guys have both the slides printed out? Uh, I don't yet. I'm going to be doing that, like, probably during lunch or something. Okay, that's cool. Do you uh, do you guys both have the figures printed out? Uh, on the slides? No. Okay, no, there's, um, if you logged oh, the in, test figures. And, mm -hmm. yeah, the test figures, it says FAA, the, the link is called FAA test figures and charts. That's, I think you get that through your portal it, under the study material. Mm -hmm. You're going to yeah, need okay. that. It's, yeah, you do have it, both of you? No, I, I, I only have don't. it pulled up on my computer. I don't have it printed off. Okay, yeah, you can pull it up on your computer just as long as you have access to it. That's going to be helpful when we get to Unit 5 because we're going to go through performance and weight and balance, and um, it will allow you guys to just kind of look at it, maybe do some problems okay. um, that, you can, that you can try on your own. Um, otherwise, it will just be me talking you through a slide after slide. Okay. So and it would just be good for you guys to try it on your own because that's what you're going to be doing on the test. Um, yeah, and so when you're turning on your compass, okay, how this applies. Uh, Martin, have you done any compass turns yet? Have you practiced that? Um, kind of a one 360-degree turn. That's what we tried. Okay. Did you just Let's do it on the – okay. Well, if you, if, you, if you lose your heading indicator and you just do it on the compass, this UNOS is a good acronym to remember. Because okay. what, it, what it basically is going to say, your instructor is going to cover up your heading indicator and you're only going to be able to navigate. He's going to say, hey, turn me to the north. So you're going to turn to the north and you're going to you're going to watch your compass. It's going to land on north. You're going to fly straight and level. And then all of a sudden, when you turn straight and level, it's, it's going to settle out at, uh, uh, past your heading north. And what you need to do is you need to undershoot north. So as that compass card turns around, as, it, as it's coming north, you need to straighten out before it hits north. You have to undershoot it because just because of the magnetic weighting, the weight that's in the compass card, it just has a, uh, just the way it's designed, it just has a northerly turning area. And then when you're south, when you get around a south heading, it accelerates really fast. So you actually have to overshoot south. You have to, you have to fly the airplane past south and then level off, and you'll see it. It will slowly come back to south. Um, so UNOS is your acronym for that. Okay, okay devia or, um, <clears throat> deviation is basically any magnetic disturbances in the aircraft. A big uh, cause of that is, well, you can see here there's some changes, um, but electrical components. And you'll find um, in a Cessna 172, uh, and other aircraft as well, you have to look in the POH and see what they say, or the AFM, whatever you want to call it, with the aircraft manual, that if you turn, if you for some reason have an electrical problem, and your alternator stops working, or for whatever reason, and stops generating electricity, in a Cessna 172, you can have compass deviations as, as great as 25 degrees. Wow. That's, that's pretty big, I mean, that's, that'll throw you really off course. Um, so, you know, the, the, the deviation, you know, um, some aircraft are equipped with a little card like this by the, the uh, compass that will let you know, hey, if you want to fly north, and, and this is not showing, some of these deviations are larger than um, 
what this card is showing, but you know, if you want to fly north, if you have your radio off, you're going to want to fly a 020 heading. Some compass cards might say 010 or Cessna might say 020. So you need to know that, and some aircraft have these cards, some aircraft don't. Okay. Um, <clears throat> here's your east is least, west is best for your true course to your magnetic course. So when you, a little formula to remember, um, and when you get into cross country planning, this will make more sense. But what you're doing is you're, when you're planning your, your cross country, you're using true headings, you know, true courses off of your Latin longitudes on your sectional. So you get your true course, and then you find out your wind correction angle. Because wind correction angles, when you, um, again, this is like the getting ahead, but you find out your wind aloft. That's, those directions are in true headings. Okay, just like your, just in line with true north. So you add or subtract your wind correction angle based on that. And then you get your true heading of your airplane right here. Okay, then you go ahead and you have your magnetic variation because now we need to, we don't fly true headings, we fly magnetic headings in the airplane. So you find your variation, so you'd add or subtract. If you have, you know, five degrees east variation, you'd subtract from your true heading. And then that gives you your magnetic heading. But then you have your magnetic deviation in the airplane. So you have to go into the airplane, look at the deviation card or the POH where it would talk about magnetic deviation due to the instruments on board that would cause some, some changes. And let's say, you know, you're, let's say you're going to fly a heading of, you know, your magnetic heading is 020 and your deviation card says on headings of 020 fly 025. So then you would go ahead and you're, your final course heading in your airplane that you would fly would be your 025. So again, this is getting a little ahead, but gives you an idea of what we're talking about, why we're talking about it. <clears throat> Whoops. Sorry guys, sometimes I click through the slides, I don't know where the last, <laughs> the last bullet point is. <clears throat> so your pedostatic flight instruments. Do you guys understand the pedostatic system at all? Yes. Okay. Um, and obviously, there's, you know, in the next slide coming up, there's a nice diagram of it. So you have your altimeter that measures, you know, it's operating on ambient pressure around the aircraft. You have your VSI, which is your vertical speed indicator, and your uh, airspeed indicator that uses ram air and the ambient pressure to interpret your airspeed uh, traveling through the air mass. Um, you really need to know how this system works because you can get errors in the system. Um, as a private pilot, it's easy to detect them because um, you're VFR. You should not be in the clouds. You know, you're seeing a void, uh, other aircraft, and you know, you can tell if, if you, you've instruments giving, you know, if your airspeed goes to zero, you can look outside and go, nope, we're still flying, you know. Um, if you or if it's showing you slowing down, or you know, you can kind of tell. Um, but you still need to know the errors that can occur. So the general gist of how this system works is ram air comes through the pitot tube, and there's a here's your static pressure, your ambient pressure through the system measures your airspeed. Do you guys know any of the errors that can occur if your pitot tube clogs? Do you guys know any errors, or you need you want me to go over well, all? The airspeed I mean, indicator would be false. The reading on the airspeed indicator, right? If your if your pitot tube here clogs, but your drain hole stays open, mm -hmm. okay, the air pressure that build up in here can bleed out. Your airspeed will just simply drop to zero. O you know, obvious makes sense, right? right. However, what can happen is you can get, here's a real world situation, you know, fly, you, you can fly through some rain as a private pilot and still be VMC, you know, visual meteorological, meteorological conditions and be legal, um, but let's say you're in altitude, that it's some freezing rain, in, or, you know, the pitot tube is just slightly cooler and freezing. Long story short, you can build up some ice, clog this drain hole, ice builds up, clogs the hole, now all this pressure remains 
and you're flying along, you know, fat, dumb, and happy, and 3,000 feet, and you don't notice it. You're not going to get an indication because the airspeed, as long as you don't change your power setting, your airspeed locks at the altitude that you are at. And what happens is this ambient pressure can change. So let's say you say, oh, I'm going to go up to 4,000 feet. When you go up to 4,000 feet, your airspeed indicator will act as an altimeter, and the needle will start to go up. And your first indication of this is going to be you're going to pitch back, you're going to start climbing, and when you, when you climb in your, in your Cessna 172 or your Cessna 152, you're pitching for airspeed. So you're going to look over, and all of a sudden you see your airspeed going up, and you're going to get really confused. <laughs> And you're going to get some vert. You're going to be like, "What is going on here?" And so that's what's happening. This claw—that's your first indication. Or if you pitch down, it's reverse trending basically. If you pitch down, your speed should increase, right? Um, unless you power back. And when you pitch down, your airspeed is going to start to drop. Okay. Um, so that's your first indication. You have a clogged pitot tube remedy. Uh, most aircraft have a pitot uh, heater switch. You turn on the pitot heat, there's heating elements, you can melt off that ice. But if a bug clogged it, you're out of luck. <laughs> but um, you're probably not going to get both clogs with a, with a bug. Okay, um, some errors that you get if the static port clogs. Um, you're, obviously, this pressure in here will just, boom, it'll lock. Nothing will change. So your altimeter which measures the ambient pressure and changes with the pressures outside to let you know your altitude, it'll lock at your, the altitude that the clog happened. Your vertical speed indicator will just, it indicates changes in the pressure. And it will, there'll be no changing in pressure, so it'll indicate straight and level. Your airspeed indicator, assuming that the ram air, and it, this is all clear, it'll be erratic. You won't, you won't have accurate readings. It, it just won't, there's no formula to it, it just won't be accurate. It might say 80 knots and you're flying 120, or it might say 120, it just, there's no rhyme or reason to it like before. Okay. Um, the That's remedy to, to the Air France uh, plane that crashed in the Atlantic, right? That it froze up, the pitot tube? Oh, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I read a little bit about that, that uh, wreck, but yeah, it, I believe what happened was, um, yeah, they had, uh, and the crazy thing about it was that that airplane, I think, has like two or three pitot tubes, like redundant systems. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And they all froze up. <laughs> so there were, like, there were like multiple redundant systems. And I think what happened was that from the radar images, um, they're still, I mean, again, they're kind of unsure, you know stuff like that. But I think what happened was they flew into a nasty storm, like the top of a storm cloud, and you can get a lot of ice. And so if all three of those things or two of those things froze up like that, I mean, you know, they shouldn't have been there in the first place. But, um, yeah, that, that is part of what happened. The static, and they didn't, they didn't interpret the, the indications correctly. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, I, again, sorry, I don't know off the top of my head. I read I read that article a while ago, so I can't really comment further on it. But, um, but yeah, so th that's why you need to understand what's going on if something clogs up, especially if you guys want to get your instrument rating. Um, you'll really learn the importance about this system. But you do need to know about it too, as a as a, uh, as a private pilot um, as well. Um, so then, the remedy to your static port clogging is an alternate static source. Um, both your Cessna should have uh, alternate air. It's a little red knob in the, in the cockpit. You pop that and you get uh, your alternate air. It adds ambient air back into the system uh, from this clog. What you need to know about that, the different uh, readings you can get um, when you're using inside cabin air is because of the slipstream effect over the cabin, it creates a lower pressure inside the cabin. And what that, what happens with that is your altimeter um, will read higher than your airplane 
is. You can have higher indications than, than what your airplane actually is. So you can say 3,000 feet, maybe you're 2,900 feet. Your airspeed will indicate a little bit higher than what the airplane is um, because of that. So it's just something to be aware of. And that's always the case? If you use in, inside cabin air, yep. If you use your alternate air inside. Okay. And then, oh, here's a little old school tip. If you happen to be in, which you very well could be as a private pilot, if you're in an older airplane that doesn't have a pedostatic port um, and you clog up, you could crack the glass on your VSI. And that'll introduce cabin air into the system. Because you don't necessarily need your VSI. It helps you out, but it's not a required instrument for flight. So you could crack the face of that, introduce pressure, uh, cabin air pressure, and then get your, your airspeed and your, your altimeter back. Huh. Mm -hmm. That's what the, the guys did in the old days. So I'm told. So I'm told. <laughs> <laughs> so you basically um, get the outside air when you're on the ground to fill the, the static port, or, or how does that work? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah, your static port's on the outside of the airplane, yes. and um, you'll, you'll check that during your pre-flight. You know, you always yes. check the pitot tube, make right. sure it's clear, and then you check the static port, make sure it's not clogged. But why would we then ever use the alternate air? If your static port got clogged in flight. Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it. Yep. <clears throat> okay. That's some of the stuff I just talked about. Um, yeah, and like I just said, the VSI, it's not required uh, instrument for VFR or IFR flight. Um, yeah, this is kind of this is kind of an IFR comment, but if you guys go onto your instrument, the FAA, if you can't climb or descend at least a 500 foot per minute rate, um, you have to notify ATC. Uh, so if your VSI is not working for some reason, if you have it iced over or whatever, you just have to start doing some math, uh, watching your altimeter. Yeah, and this is just a statement, just something you need to know. Um, outside air temperature increases during a flight, and you know you're in a constant. Uh, indicated airspeed power setting, your true airspeed through that um, air mass will increase and your true altitude will increase as well. Um, and those terms we go into detail and, uh, for, uh, further ahead, getting a little ahead there. So we talked about the airspeed indicator, how it works, you know, the ram air and basically your green arc is your normal operating range, your yellow arc is your caution range, your red line is your never expeed, or exceed, prohibited, illegal, do not go past that speed. You're going to be an experimental pilot and potentially rip the wings off, not good. And the bottom of your green arc is typically, and you guys are flying, I know you guys are flying Cessna, you know, um, technically for the test, it's considers your VS1 or your stall speed in a specific configuration. How that looks real world in your Cessna, that's your takeoff configuration, that's your, your flaps all cleaned up, clean airplane, um, you know, you're just cruising. If you were to slow down to the bottom of that green arc, that's your stall speed approximately at full gross weight. Um, your white arc is your flap operating range. Uh, the bottom of the white arc is your landing configuration, or VSO, and that's full flaps, power off condition. That's, and remember that, it's a power off condition, not a power on condition, uh, stall speed. And you'll learn that when you practice stalls and you do slow flight and all that. Um, and you actually notice if, you, if you're power on, you do some slow flight, try to take your airspeed indicator below your white, your white arc here. You can still fly the airplane and not stall it. Um, and when you're flying your Cessnas as well, those stall warning horns that go off uh, typically go off anywhere from five to ten knots above stall speed. So you're not, um, you're still pretty far from stalling the airplane as that horn's going off. 
and again, that depends. It's a little. It'll be a little different between your 152 and your your one uh, your 172. Um, another thing to note, just because I know you guys are flying Cessnas, um, I, I'm not 100% on the 152. I haven't flown one since like 2004. I've only really flown 172s and Pipers since then. Um, the 172, you actually it's placarded. You can do 10 degrees of flaps at 110 knots. Just a little. Uh, aha for you. Um, oh, and then the VA, we were talking about maneuvering speed, which is a really important speed. It is not marked on your airspeed indicator. Now, maybe, like I said, on a placard, like up here, like a little punch out or a sticker or something, you know, um, but it's not going to be on your airspeed indicator. Uh, vertical speed indicator. Um, Sorry, I was looking at my slides there for a second. Your vertical speed indicator is pretty straightforward. It measures the change in static pressure on your static port. It, it has like a calibrated leak in it, and it just basically, as the pressure is changing as you climb or descend, it's calibrated to interpret that for you uh, mechanically with the needle um, in a thousand foot per minute um, increments. So. Uh, you know, 0.5 on, on this scale. A lot of them just say 500, 1,000. You know, but this one is 0.5. That's 500 feet a minute. You know, type thing. So, some different types of altitude that you guys need to be familiar with is your pressure altitude. Um, that is when you know a standard. Do you guys uh, understand standard conditions and what that means? Like your standard day. Is that the yeah. one at sea level? Mm hmm 15 degrees Celsius? Yep. Yeah. Basically, uh, uh, you know, a standard, perfect atmospheric condition that never occurs. Uh, <laughs> it, yeah, at sea level, you would have a pressure of 299 or 2 inches of mercury on a barometer, and you would have your 15 degrees Celsius uh, would, would be your, your temperature. Um, so your pressure altitude um, is when you, you set the pressure scale, or you can find it by setting your altimeter. You could do it in flight. You could do it on the ground if you're curious. You know, you're sitting at your airplane, maybe doing some performance charts before you, before you pre-flight and take off. Uh, you just you can set set your altimeter two nine or nine or two. That'll give you pressure altitude. Um, your true altitude is simply your vertical distance above sea level. The airplane's vertical distance, if I were to take a tape measure and go from sea level up to the bottom of your airplane, that would be your true altitude. Your indicated altitude is what's indicated on your, in your um, altimeter. Pretty straightforward. The only time it's the same as true altitude is if uh, you're at sea level and you have standard conditions in the atmosphere. Um, there's different reasons for that. It's, it's hard to get uh, true altitude calculation just because of temperature variations and lapse rates and you know that standard condition just never really happens in nature. <clears throat> um, your absolute altitude, vertical distance above the surface. Um, if you were to you know, take a tape measure from the you're flying overhead uh, in Pennsylvania. You know the, the the some of the hills are you know 1,500 feet above sea level. So the absolute altitude would be taking that tape measure from the ground that you're or the obstacle that you're flying over and going to the bottom of your airplane, and that's your absolute distance above the the surface. Um, another thing about true altitude, your uh, obstacles on your sectional and charts, and you'll learn about that in, in, when we go over. Uh, well, tomorrow when you go over cross-country planning and charts and stuff like that, um, your, your obstacles on those charts are in true altitude. Um, <clears throat> density altitude is pressure altitude corrected for non-standard conditions. Um, what that means is essentially when you calculate out your density altitude, 
that the best way to, to understand that is it's where your airplane feels like it's flying. So if you're at 3,000 feet and based on, you know, non-standard temperatures, a hotter day or, you know, a, a, a lower than normal uh, pressure or something of that nature, your density altitude can increase and um, your airplane could feel like it's flying at 4,000 feet because as you go up in altitude, you lose density. So warmer than standard, um, the density altitude will be higher um, than your pressure altitude. Here's how your true altitude looks, you know, above sea level, absolute, just to give you a little visual here. Um, any questions on that stuff? I know the altitude stuff can be a little goofy. Nope. Okay. And then do if, you understand? Uh, if if our, uh, we're, we're using true altitude, don't we just uh, subtract the elevation where we're currently at, like say Missouri, you know, 1,300 feet above sea level, don't we just subtract that from the true altitude and that just, that's what we can use for, you know, our, our indication? You mean when you're flying? Yeah. Well, you're, you're, um, <laughs> yes and no. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, because, yeah, you're thinking in the right way, but the problem is, is that when you're at altitude, you're, you're reading an indicated altitude that's corrected okay. for a non-standard pressure, so you're, you're turning your altimeter to an altimeter setting because mm -hmm. the pressure of that area, but it's not correcting for temperatures. Okay. So, so that's why we say if you're in a higher than, than standard temperature at that altitude, your true altitude is actually going to be higher than what you're indicating, and there, there's just no, your altimeter is not correcting for the temperatures outside. Okay. Um, but you could do a computer, I mean, if you, if you wanted to, I mean, everybody flies with indicated altitude, but if you really wanted to, to calculate it, you could with your flight computer. You okay. can take the outside air temperature and do that, yeah. Um, so here's, you know, picture your altimeter. Hmm. Any questions on the altimeter? Uh, this is reading, you know, your small hands reading. Uh, if you were at, at sea level, you know, it, it would be um, increments up to 1,000 feet, or I'm sorry, 100 feet, um, and then up to 200, 300, 400, you know, and then this hand would be your 1,000. So it's just read kind of like a clock, and then this small hand, um, which I've taken a Cessna up above 10,000, uh, barely got there, uh, but it can be done, and then you could get this little tiny guy here excited. <laughs> All right. So every inch of, um, you know, uh, mercury is, is like a, a thousand uh, foot altitude gain basically in the Colesman window. And the Colesman window is is this window here with your um, pressure setting. So, you know, if your altimeter and your ATIS is 3001, you know, you'd rotate it and put the, these are in 2, 4, 6, 8. So you kind of go halfway in between and set it up here on this line. And then you should be within, again, temperature can change it a bit. You know your true altitude on your chart is saying, um, let's say, you know, it's a, a thousand feet is your airport elevation. Well, the, alt the temperature can adjust a little bit, but it's minor. And so that's why we don't really calculate or have altimeters that need to calculate the true altitude for the temperature because you need to be within plus or minus 75 feet of your field elevation um, when you set your altimeter setting. If not, then th there may be um, something wrong with your altimeter. So that's kind of like a pre-flight uh, thing you, should, you need to know about it. Um, so your Colesman window changes the settings. Does that all make sense, guys, the altimeter setting and all that? Mm -hmm. Why we set it? So the small numbers, what do they refer to in, in the little um, thing? That right here? Do? Yes. That would be your altimeter setting. Um, 
at the airport. Locally. Yeah, at the airport. Yep. And when you're flying, um, <clears throat> and that's in feet. So this would be two thousand nine hundred ninety feet. In this case. No, 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 no. Um, that would be like two nine nine or two would be your standard day. It's just measuring your. What it's saying is, is that um, every inch of mercury is like a thousand foot change on your altimeter. I'm sorry. Okay, so, that's, oh, that's the HG re, um, reading right in there. Right. Oh, right. Okay. So, it, so if your pressure altitude is two nine nine or two, okay. The reason you need to know that change is because, so if you're if you're indicated here, this is a thousand four hundred feet. Let's call it fourteen hundred. If your local altimeter setting um, was one inch higher than this, mm -hmm. okay, um, was three zero zero point nine or three zero point zero nine, okay, this would actually rotate a thousand feet. Okay. Does that make sense? So when you're calculating pressure altitude, when you go to two nine nine or two, the difference between your current altimeter setting and the two nine nine or two per inch is is a thousand feet. Okay. And Does in the chart sense? in the one chart that you showed earlier with the mountain and the sea level? Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't get the differences here between the true and absolute altitude. Uh, this one, yeah. Okay. Yep, true altitude. So the, the difference here is this is your altitude above sea level. So that's measured from sea level. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then your absolute altitude is above the ground, the above terrain the you're flying over. Yep. And the pressure altitude is measured from below sea level? Yeah, the pressure altitude, it's called a standard datum plane. This changes. I mean, this this standard plane can, can virtually move, okay? Mm -hmm. But it's basically measuring your altitude in comparison with 299 or 2. Oh, okay. If that makes sense. And that that is used, the reason that, that altitude will come up, it'll come up in Unit 5, uh, our last session for the day, but um, it factors in when you're calculating your density altitude and your performance of the airplane. Mm -hmm. And standard datum plane, what does that refer to? That is um, the ground below sea level, or no? The standard the standard datum plane can actually move. <laughs> it's it's goofy. Um, it's just really based on the atmospheric conditions. It's just saying that. Another time we use 299 or 2 is any time an airplane's flying above 18,000 feet. Mm -hmm. They're traveling so fast, they're so high, uh, they all just tune to 299 or 2, so they're all flying pressure altitudes. They all, if, the, if one's indicating, you know what I mean, they're not at different altitudes being indicated. They're all indicating the same altitude above this imaginary ground level, mm. if, that, if that makes sense. It's hard, I mean, I'm, I know it's, it's kind of goofy. It's hard to explain to not like sit next to you, and, but I mean, does that make any sense or no? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try, yeah, I'm trying to do my best. It's 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 a weird concept to to uh, display, but or to ta to the describe, but yeah, it's just it's the altitude that that you indicate right. when you set to two nine or two. I mean, that's the right. So and and I noticed when we hold short before the uh, the runway, there is the sign on the ground that shows the setting that we need to set the um, altimeter to, right? Correct. And and the, it, that is the pressure, not the feet of the airport, right? Correct. That yeah, that is the air pressure being measured at your airport at that time, and and that's important because then you adjust your because your, your altimeter is calibrated against barometric pressure, so you have to set in the current to make sure you're indicating the correct altitude, you have to set in that current altimeter setting, that current your current barometric pressure setting at your elevation. Mm -hmm. And then that's why you cross-reference and make sure, okay, am I within 75 feet of, of my elevation to make sure my altimeter is working correctly? Got it. Okay. okay. So your uh, your altimeter, the one that you just showed, that yep. is uh, that gives us our indicated altitude, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. 
Yep. So pretty much going off this at uh, 299 or 2, okay, for your local yep. area. What if you're flying across country? How are you going to know when to change that? I mean, mm -hmm. good perfect. question. Um, you want what you're going to be doing as you fly along your, your cross country as you plan it. Um, you'll have airports along the way, and you will, you know, make note to yourself at certain points. You, you always want to, okay. Within, you know, the FAA says 100 miles, but it's always okay. good to be tuned within 50 miles of an airport. So every 50 okay. miles, you're going to want to update your altimeter setting. Um, gotcha. Yeah, that's. I mean, that would be my recommendation every 50 miles, but they say up to 100. Sense. Yeah. Okay. Because what's going to happen is if you forget. You could be mm -hmm. flying at 3,000, and there's a drastic pressure change, and all the other mm -hmm. aircraft are tuned to a different setting. And now yeah. you, you see what I'm saying? So, yeah, you could be flying head in, head on yeah. to someone yeah. else's altitude. Exactly. Where, where would we get that information? Through an, another radio communication? or You would just tune, tune to the ATIS. To the ATIS. Of, yep. the, next, of the next airport that is, that is along the route. Yep. Yeah, you could just pick one. As you're flight planning, you could write a little note at a checkpoint and say, oh, tune to whatever, North County Airport's uh, ATIS and pick up the latest Got altimeter. It. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Yep. Okay. Colesman window. We already talked about it prior takeoff, 75 feet. Um, like we said, the temperature variations affect the altimeter. Um, on warmer days, the indicated altitude is lower than uh, your true altitude. Um, I think there, yeah, there's a there's a, a picture of that in the next slide to let you know. And if you're flying into colder weather, your airplane actually may be lower than what you're indicating. Um, and as the uh, temperature increases, your density altitude increases at a given airport. Again, that's where your aircraft feels like it's flying. And the performance, as you go up, your density, your air molecules get spread apart, and you lose performance on your airplane. You know, climb rate, et cetera. Um, we already kind of talked about this. I mean, you guys understand how to read the, the face of the altimeter? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. This print, you know, I'm sorry, guys. I'm looking here, and I have a printout, and it's not matching. Yeah, it's not matching the slides. Yeah, do you guys have the same thing? Yes. I don't the have my printout. That I have is different than the slides that you're showing. Yeah, because I'm I'm anticipating this next chart here, but okay, we're good. It's coming up though. So um, the altimeter errors, uh, we pretty much talked about them. They're just kind of restated here. Uh, the colder temperatures, we just said that. And here here's the the pilot term you'll hear. You might hear it from your instructor. I honestly I learned it in my private pilot, and I still think about it today. High to low, look out below. <laughs> so, it, and it applies to temperature and pressure, and all that simply means is if you're flying, you know, uh, I don't know, 200 nautical miles away, and you take off, and it's 80 degrees out, and where you're landing happens, there's a cold front or something you pass through, and it happens to be 50 degrees at your airport you're landing at. Um, you're Altimeter indication: You're you're going to be slightly lower than what your altimeter, what your uh, altimeter is indicating. Okay. Just something to be aware of. So the ground is closer. That is what that means, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Because um, the pressure has changed from warmer air to colder air, right? Correct. Yep. Okay. And then here, this is this is the chart. This is the um, picture I was trying, the visual I was trying to find. That in my slide it said it was coming up, but it didn't right away. Uh, so this is just a visual indication of that. So um, these aircraft, because it's a pressure-based altimeter with the current altimeter setting, okay, is indicating 5,000 feet. 
all okay. three of these aircraft are. One is in a column of air at that same pressure at 30 degrees C. Okay, he's indicating 5,000, and mm -hmm. C, I mean, does that make sense? Yeah. He's, his airplane's actually higher, but as he slowly flies into 15 C, and you're not going to notice it. It's not like your altimeter is all of a sudden going to change, and you know, mm -hmm. you're, you're just flying along and you're maintaining your altitude and little variations. And before you know it, the airplane is actually a different altitude above sea level or above okay. the ground. Um, so this is kind of a visual picture of it. And the reason that we don't calculate, you know, we don't need to calculate our true altitudes we're flying is because all the other aircraft are indicating the same thing. Yeah. So everybody's everybody's changing through the air column. Mm -hmm. and, and this is an exaggerated view of it, um, if yeah. that makes sense. It's not like you're... So it's still reading 5,000, um, but it uh, the plane with the yellow arrow would be at kind of four, uh, 3,500 feet or something like that. Um, not even, not even that dramatic. Um, this, like I said, this picture makes it look more dramatic than it is. Um, okay. But, but yeah, it's it's hard to calculate that because th there's the lapse rate in the atmosphere, which is the temperature. So, it's really hard to calculate. If there's no science of oh, at this exact altitude, pressure level, temperature, it's going to be this. Um, mm. But maybe a hundred feet. You know, maybe he's at re maybe he's really at forty nine hundred feet. And that would come into play in an instrument approach, um, and certainly, you know, as you're flying VFR as well. Uh, so yeah, he, here's another take on on pressure. Um, you know, from high to low, look out below. Hot to cold, look out below. Um, all right, vacuum system. Are you guys familiar with the instruments and how they work on the vacuum system? Uh, yeah. Okay, you guys familiar with gyros and mm -hmm. the vacuum system spinning the gyros and rigidity in space and all that? Mm, that no, fun I'm not stuff. familiar with that. Okay. Um, I don't think, let me look through my slides here, if there's a visual on a gyro. You don't really need to know uh, too much specifically about the gyro for the test, um, but just so you know, I mean, a gyro, it's a spinning object, any, any spinning object. And imagine like a top, if you spin a top and how it stands erect, okay, as it's spinning, and then uh, the faster it goes, obviously, the more uh, uh, stable it is. Well, these instruments, these gyroscopic instruments have spinning discs in them, and it keeps them rigid, and they, they get up to high, high RPM thousands and thousands, I think it's over like 5,000 RPM. I mean, they spin mm -hmm. incredibly fast, and they, it's called rigidity in space. So they, on the ground, your plane is sitting on the pavement, flat and level, and these gyros spin up, and this air, this vacuum, air is drawn through by the vacuum, vacuum driven pump, and over the vein, there's like little veins, and again, I'm sorry guys, I don't have a visual for that, um, that spin the gyro. That's how it works, and it keeps it erect. So as your plane banks, it banks and turns around this gyro that throughout the whole flight stays in the same position. Okay. And there's some precession. Um, your flight instructor will teach you that, and we'll talk about it briefly with the heading indicator. Um, precession is just from friction, so it can it can turn the gyro. But your vacuum system is your. This is your typical. This is a basic outline of a vacuum system. Um, I know the Cessna 172s, the newer models I fly, I'm not sure about you guys, you'd have to look at the POH, but like our models have two vacuum pumps, which is just redundancy and safety. Um, some older models I think only have one vacuum pump. But these power your, vac your heading indicator, your attitude indicator. Um, if you have a loss of vacuum, which is indicated from your gauge, these instruments are going to become unreliable. And then that's that's why you learn compass turns, because if you lose your directional gyro right here, your heading indicator, you'll have to rely on the compass by itself um, for heading. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, this is just talking about the principles of gyros. Um, 
you know, remain in, in motion, uh, straight line, deflection. It's in, so there's some gyroscopic, uh, that would apply to the propeller, you know, when you move it a certain way, how it can rotate. Um, Pre-flight, okay, pre-flight, your turn coordinator now is an electrically powered gyroscope. Um, the reason for that is just some safety built in that if you were to lose your vacuum, your attitude indicator right here, okay, provides you if your wings are level or banked, right, and your degree of bank. With your turn coordinator, um, if you lose vacuum, you, you'll still have your turn coordinator. Is there a picture of it coming up? There's got to be a picture. Here you go. This will provide you bank information. This will let you know if your wing's level or not. If you get yourself into a low visibility situation, that's really important. Um, visually, if you're VMC, you can tell if your wings are level pretty easily. Um, but in your pre-flight, you want to listen to that electro electric gyroscope powering up. And you want to make sure when you turn your power off that, that little there's a little red flag that pops up that says, you know, it's off. That's that's gonna be your indication in flight uh, if your system fails. Your vacuum system, you have a gauge, you're gonna lose suction, you're gonna start to get some weird turns, your you know, your attitude indicator might show a, a bank or a descending turn or climb or you know um, but your electric will be erratic too, and then you'll get a little flag. And the turn coordinator again just shows your yaw, you know, the ball that we talk about keeping center, and your roll. Um, I noticed during flight that the turn coordinator, the little airplane that's sh shown in the turn coordinator, um, moves differently than um, in the in the artificial horizon. W what's the reason for that? So usually, the the turn coordinator airplane moves a little slower and more sluggish than the the artificial horizon. Yeah, um, I think part of that is just the design of it. Um, the the artificial horizon is more free as your airplane rotates against it, and the turn coordinator kind of is limited. It, it doesn't go forward and back, so some of that it has to do with the gyroscopic precession that can occur. So if you're if you happen to be pitching while you're banking, that can delay its response a little bit in oh, how it it moves about in there, and I think too it. it it's it accelerate. It, it's a lower RPM than the vacuum system gyros, so there's some delay in in there too. Just the way it's designed, basically. So it when I look for delay. when I look for um, information about what bank I'm in, I would look for the uh, on the artificial horizon and not on the turn coordinator, right? Correct. With the turn coordinator, the most crucial information there is just that the ball is centered, right? Correct. Yeah, your turn coordinator would be a secondary um, indication of just letting you know if your 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 severity of your bank, basically. Yes. Um, but yeah, primarily for for private pilot purposes, you're using it to let you know if your wings are level or not. Um, com to compare it, also to reference, you want to use it to reference against your attitude indicator because. Um, if it's indicating wings level in your attitude indicator, f for example, this is why you, you have to learn a really good instrument scan, um, more for instrument rating but also private pilot, meaning that if your attitude indicator is indicating a left bank, your turn indicator is indicating wings level, mm -hmm. and your heading indicator is indicating that there's no turn. You're on the same heading. You have two instruments telling you you're flying straight and level or at least you're, you're not turning. And so that would be an indication that your attitude indicator has probably failed. Your, your gyro, you know, maybe just seized up oh, okay. or something like that. So that's another reason. So yeah, it just gives you some bank information and in your coordination. Um, and the two minute or two min, what does that refer to on the turn coordinator? Mm -hmm. Okay, this right here, the two min, that's telling you that 
the other uh, information that this is helpful with, and really in your, if you go for an instrument rating, you'll use this a lot. <laughs> um, under instrument conditions, you, you make, it's called a standard rate turn. And this, these hash marks right here are your standard rate turn. And at, when you put the wing, you know, in a left bank, and you put the wing right here, you know you're in a standard rate turn, and you'll complete a full 360 degree turn in two minutes. That's what that means. Oh, okay. So you can, you can uh, time, you can okay. time your turn, and that that'll actually aid you in a compass turn, because if you, um, if you're gonna make a you know, a 180 degree turn, and you know your compass is kind of erratic, and you know you're on a, a north heading, um, you just time it. You could, you could. Uh, if you lose your heading indicator, for instance, you could time it. And, and you'd learn those more in, in instrument rating. You learn time turns and things like that. Cool. Interesting. Uh, yeah. Oh, whoops. Um, so, yeah, again, it shows you, yeah, and that, that's how, like, the ball, like when we were talking earlier about aerodynamics and rotating the yaw with the rudder around the vertical axis, that or axis that's indicated primarily from your ball on your turn coordinator, um, and again, it's good to note it's electrically operated. So if for some reason you lose your electrical system, you will lose your um, you know your alternator goes bad and you lose battery power. You you lose your um, that's one of the instruments you would lose in addition to your radios and mostly everything else. But <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> a turn and slip indicator. Um, this does not. Th this is an older instrument, um, not as uh, not as reliable. I mean, I've flown with these before in older aircraft, and they're really. You talk about how there's a delay in the turn coordinator. I mean, this one's even more kind of goofy, but it'll indicate to you standard rate turn. That's what those hash marks are. They're a two-minute turn, um, but you don't get as reliable. Um, bank information with the wings level. Okay, I haven't seen that one in the in the C one hundred and fifty. Okay. Yeah. So your pre-flight on this um, this could come up on the test. You know, you just want your your needle centered, your tube full of fluid, and the ball should be pretty much about centered. Uh, given that you're on level pavement. Um, and during your taxi turns, to check this instrument, uh, if you turn to the left, here, here's some taxi checks on your instruments. Your attitude indicator should, should be, you know, up and erect and, and level. Um, your, when you taxi, uh, you should be getting accurate indications on your heading indicator. You know, turn left, it turns you left. You turn right, it turns right. On your turn coordinator, you should be getting the ball should be going to the outside of the turn. When you taxi, you just do like a little little side to side movement, and then your um, wings should go in the direction of turn as well. Um, and your attitude indicator as well. This little airplane, if you haven't tried it yet, moves up and down. So when when they're talking about the gyro getting erect during your your taxi out talking about this artificial horizon in the back, but somebody like me, I'm a tall guy, I'm 6'4", so I might have sat in the airplane before somebody who's a little bit shorter, you know, in my perspective, I might have adjusted this airplane and moved it. So you want to adjust this airplane to put the wings level before you take off. Mm. And the little, the little yellow dot in the middle, is that the nose? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So because yeah. I fly, my flight instructor, she said... Um, kind of keep the nose on the horizon during, you know, turns, when we do steep turns and go in a, in a circle, then this is basically what I can look at as well um, to keep that on the horizon, right, that little yellow dot. Yeah, uh, if she's telling you keep the nose, I mean, um, she's, she, is she referencing the instrument specifically or is she just saying, hey, keep the nose on the horizon? Um, keep the nose on the horizon. Um, so to look outside, basically, but I noticed yeah. kind of that, that this is in line with that little yellow dot. 
Right. Yeah, you could do that as well. Um, you may not get the same exact indication because the site picture is going to be a little bit different than what the instrument's indicating. But it but it is good to cross reference. You you want to be as a private pilot, VFR pilot, you want to learn both. But you want to primarily learn because what do we have to do? We have to see and avoid. We have to. We're responsible for seeing and avoiding other aircraft. We're um, not ATC or anybody else. So you want to keep your eyes outside the aircraft learn to be able to look and see and avoid and fly the airplane in those maneuvers. But yeah, you do want to look down and see what the instruments are doing too because you need to know what they look like as well. So a little bit of both, but I'd say primary focus outside. Right. That's what she said. 90% should be outside. Yeah. Yep. Um, so yeah, you will, um, again, attitude. I mean, do you guys get the attitude indicator pretty good? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, heading indicator, pretty straightforward. Um, the thing to know about this is about about every 10, 15 minutes, and it really depends on the airplane. I mean, I, I have a, a, there's a 172 I've been flying recently that the procession is fantastic. I mean, it, it like, I almost went through a whole hour of flight and did not have to adjust the heading indicator. Have have you guys noticed that yet? Do you know, I mean, you understand how you have to adjust it because of precession mm -hmm. to your magnetic compass, Martin. You might have done that already. I think we did, but I forgot how it works. Yeah. So basically, when you're on the ground, this gyro is going to spin up inside the the instrument casing here, right. and um, after about yeah, give it about five minutes or so, and then before takeoff, you really want to make sure that it, you look at your magnetic compass. You're sitting still, and you you set this to the magnetic compass, so it's reflecting right. your heading. Mm -hmm. um, as you fly, because of some perception friction on the gyro, it can become inaccurate. Mm -hmm. And it may be off by five degrees. Some airplanes are bad. I mean, it just depends on the, the age of the instrument. And, and so that's why I said the this one Cessna I've been flying has is, is been great. I mean, it after like a half an hour, I looked at it, and I'm like, wow, it's matched up with the compass still. You know, um, but every about 15 minutes, you want to make sure it's matched up with that that compass. Okay. Um, so here you go. Here's your five minutes and all that. And periodically line up with your magnetic compass. <clears throat> Glass cockpits. These are really cool. Um. Unbelievable wealth of information in these cockpits. Um, <clears throat> you name it, they do it. <laughs> um, monitor the progress of your flight, your engine monitoring, your navigation. Um, I actually uh, got my instrument rating on a G1000 equipped uh, 172, and I mean, I mean, it would it would calculate your it monitors your fuel consumption. You could calculate your fuel burn. I mean, it. You could just do your whole pre-flight, pretty much your cross-country planning on it. I mean, it was unbelievable. I mean, I, we didn't do it that way. We did it old school, but you know. But it, this is actually it right here. This is this isn't the plane I flew, but this is a 172 cockpit, I believe, with the G1000. Nice. Um, but pretty cool systems. Um, they operate a lot differently. They don't have. Uh, they have some for safety, like you have your attitude indicator that's a gyro vacuum driven system. You have a backup altimeter on a pedostatic system, an old airspeed indicator, but everything's pretty much interpreted. All the information's on here. Um, but isn't that dangerous in, in an electric failure when you don't have the turn coordinator anymore? Well, your, co your turn coordinate, well, the whole thing's electric. Um, right, but I, if you have a failure, then the you're saying, up is yeah. gone, and then you don't have the old school turn coordinator, right? Right, correct. You don't. Um, there's a turn coordinator built in. It's really small here. You can't see it, but it'll indicate to you whether your rate of turn, and and then there's a little thing up here that indicates whether you're coordinated. So it's a lot different. Um, but the way that this system is built for safety, because of that, is if you were to lose your alternator it'll go over to battery power. There's two separate batteries. Um, there's a, a, a primary battery and then a backup battery. And it, The standby battery gives you about an hour 
So hopefully, you know, you can get on the ground within an hour, find an airport to go to. Um, if you lose a screen here, it's designed, it'll shift this whole screen over to this screen. Okay. It'd be a little awkward looking over there, but you'll still have everything. So everything should still be powered for up to an hour with the standby battery. Okay. Same thing here. If, if you lose this screen, your engine instruments, you'll, you will lose this main thing. But if this screen dies, these engine instruments line up over here. Okay. And then your radios and all that are right in here. Nice. Your frequencies and everything. Um, it's a pretty safe, redundant system. They've really thought of that. But yeah, I mean, if if you're just really having a bad day and everything goes, um, you're going to be relying on the compass and uh, the attitude indicator. Right. Um, but it's got to be a really, really bad day if you're going to lose your vacuum and your your screens and everything. Mm. Um, here, uh, main takeaway here is just the PFD, that's that left side of the screen, your main screen, your MFD, uh, showing all your accessory stuff, your big pictorial view. And the takeaway here is it shouldn't be used as a primary navigation instrument, just a supplement. You have a little moving map picture here, and your primary navigate, your, your scan, your little T scan, if you've learned it already, on your six pack is, is right in here. And they're just saying, don't be staring over here and looking at the picture and seeing where you're going. You know, just supplement it, but you're primarily navigating here with an HSI. Um, hmm. Which an HSI, do you guys know what an HSI is? No. Um, yes. Okay. I don't, yeah. I don't remember the specific function, though. Yeah. Um, Basically, it's like your directional indicator here, your heading indicator, and then it has navigation like VOR and, and um, built into it. Where the heck did that picture go? Yeah. So, so like your navigation's built into it. Just horizontal situation indicators, what's it called? Um, and then in regards to this scan that, that we're talking about, um, wait, where is it? Yeah, using a regular scan, big pitfall here, lots of cool stuff in the cockpit, does all kinds of things. You could, you could sit here and play for half an hour doing stuff over in the MFD, calculating things. and You can get charts, you can get instrument approach charts depending on your via, you know, VFR pilot, seeing a void. If you ever get in an airplane like this, just make sure you're, you know, really looking outside the cockpit. Again, 90% outside. Yeah, look for those other uh, 